Abandoned by his mother at birth, little Clifford Oxnard grows up in South Minneapolis as the target of bullies and big dogs. In Garrison Keillor's Me by Jimmy Big Boy Valenti, Clifford is transformed by a mail-order bodybuilding course into the massive He-Man, Jimmy Big Boy Valenti. He enlists in the Navy's elite walrus program and is sent off to Vietnam. When he returns, he begins a long career as a star in professional wrestling. After Big Boy hangs up his tights, he's elected governor of Minnesota. This is James Houck. Please join me for Garrison Keillor's satirical piece, Me, by Jimmy Big Boy Valenti. This is James Houck. Today we begin Me, by Jimmy Big Boy Valenti, as told to, that is written by, Garrison Keeler. It is published by Viking of Penguin Putnam Incorporated. Copy. Fall, when she returned to Mount Holyoke for her senior year, where she majored in French and was a fencer and in the drama club, and in December she and her two best friends took the train to New York to see Come Back Little Sheba, and there one night in the St. Regis Hotel she looked at herself naked in a mirror and realized she had to confront the fact of my existence. She telephoned home in the morning and confessed. She wept. She pled for forgiveness. She lied. She told them she'd been forced by a friend into having sex and that she could not divulge his name because she had promised not to. She told them that she loved her fiancé and she could not bear the thought of causing him pain. Her family swung into action. A conference was called. Emissaries were dispatched to the fiancé's family. Negotiations were begun and by the second week of January a deal was struck whereby I would disappear, the wedding would take place in April, the groom would be indemnified by a sum of $200,000 for her loss of virginity, and the family would post a bond of half a million to assure her faithfulness for the first ten years of marriage. I was born in January 1952 in a third-floor maid's room at her family mansion in the midst of a Minnesota blizzard, born premature, a puny four-pounder, bald and bug-eyed, too enervated to wail, and was carried by the chauffeur to the black Chrysler and gently laid on the back seat and was driven through the drifted streets of Minneapolis to University Hospital, where I lay and baked in a glass drum for two months, a feeding tube stuck into the top of my skull, a free floating object in the world, available to anyone for the asking. I knew none of this until November. A man can learn much about himself by getting elected governor. After November, the press went to work and dredged up the adoption papers and paid off a clerk at county welfare and tracked down my poor old mother and found her in an alcoholic daze at the Minneapolis club and pumped her for details, talked to her friends. The day before yesterday, that vile gutter snipe Jeff Lundberg of the Minneapolis Star Tribune phoned to ask corroboration and comment on it. That is why I have rushed this book into print. I want to be the first to tell my own story. And I want it told 100% truthfully, minus those cruel lies that the press tosses in, such as the totally erroneous notion that I was named Josh. One, I was never named Josh. I was once Clifford Oxnard, and now I am Jimmy Big Boy. At no time was my name Josh. I am prepared to sue the knees off anyone who states otherwise. 2. I do not live in terror of a man known as the rodent. He is a deeply troubled man, and I am fully prepared for him whenever he should make an appearance. 3. I never promised the good people of Minnesota a $1,000 tax refund for every man, woman, and child. I only promised a refund if the money was actually there. It wasn't. Had I known the money wasn't there, I wouldn't have promised it. It's just that simple. 4. I am not a yuppie. Take my word for it. I don't collect art or drive a blazer. I can bench press 325 pounds. I don't care for fruit. I feel that almost any dish could be improved by putting bacon and melted cheese on it. As for movies, Woody Allen is fine if you enjoy watching videos of other people's birthday parties, but I keep falling asleep. Arnold Schwarzenegger's the man. If you want to be the man, you got to beat the man. Woody Allen has never made a movie that can touch the Terminator. No comparison. 
People think Woody Allen can write because he's jittery. That's BS. I was elected governor of Minnesota because the people of Minnesota can see through blizzards of BS and appreciate common sense. I rode around Minnesota in a rented motor home with defoliate in 98 painted on the sides and raised a flag of rebellion and told the people, I can do the job and I am not a politician and I do not lie. That was all they needed to know. Using the discipline from my walrus training and my years in the ring, taking control of the situation, staring the bonzos down, whacking them into their holes, going non-stop for weeks at a time, town after town, rallying the people to the ethical party. I was beautifully rewarded on election night. I stood on the balcony of the Jimmy for Governor headquarters suite at the Lucky Luker Casino Hotel and leaned over the railing my arm around Lacey and yelled, Governor of Minnesota, that's me, baby. Better get used to it. I was pumped. I'd been on diet supplements I get from a Mexican supplier to keep my adrenaline up and both of us were flying high on Brandy Alexander's. Lacey had worn a black velvet blouse that always turns me on, and an insinuating perfume, and I took her in my arms and kissed her long and hard. I think she suddenly liked being married to a head of state. And then I saw the red rose taped to the railing. She was saying, Well, congratulations, champ. Now what do we do? Maneuver you into bed and tear your clothes off, I said as I inspected the rose. There was a note taped to it that said, Congratulations from the rat. I flung it over the railing and it fluttered down six stories to the hotel terrace. I turned to Lacey. I've been on the sawdust trail for three months in the cause of statesmanship, and now I would like to mix my perspiration with yours, I said. But I was thinking about the note. As I unbuttoned her blouse, I made a mental note to get my automatic pistol out of the overnight bag and slide it under the mattress. What about the kids, she said. They're wide awake and bouncing off the ceiling. They want to be with us, and your supporters are down in the ballroom hollering their heads off. Send the children down to talk to the supporters, and she did. When she went into the bathroom to put on her negligee, I loaded the pistol and stuck it under the mattress and double-latched the door and slipped into that king-size bed and made love to her. And when I came up for air, I saw on the TV screen Tiffany and Adrian at the podium telling everyone how great their dad was going to be. And suddenly, my wife hollered and tossed her head back and forth and writhed and panted, and I yelled and pounded my fist against the bed. And that was when I found the second red rose. It was taped to the picture over the bed, one of those fake French landscapes. I leaped up from the sheets and grabbed it, did you come, she moaned. The second note said, Well, did you? The rodent, I gasped. Lacey tried to pull me back down into bed, but I showered fast and dressed in a t-shirt and running pants, pistol in the pocket, and took an elevator down to the ballroom. I looked everywhere, and the rodent was nowhere to be seen. People were trying to grab my hand, slap my back, buy me a drink, interview me, and I kept looking in dark corners for a sawed-off, slant-eyed, pigtailed terrorist whose avowed aim in life is to cut my jugular vein with his teeth and kill me. The next morning I had a headache that went down to my knees, but I appeared on every network news show in America and told them I was the start of the new wave and to look out. I was the blue-eyed hero. People were talking about me wherever I went. Lacey was photographed for People magazine, and I was on the cover of Time. Jay Leno wanted me. David Letterman called personally. John Travolta telephoned me, and Geraldo, and Joan Rivers, and Ricky Lake, and Jerry Springer, and Cokie Roberts, and Donald Trump, and Oliver Stone, and Al Franken, and dozens of others. And I got this terrific book deal, a cool half million to sit and talk about myself. Easy work if you can get it. I am not an author, so this book is not going to be big on daffodils and Tintern Abbey and the stuff they stuck in our ears in high school English like... I passed a field where children drink from buttercups of dew. I passed eternity, I think, or maybe it was you. As I told my ghostwriter, Mr. Keeler, very clearly at the outset, this is not a book where I resolve the issues of my troubled childhood or dream about a world united in peace and harmony. Ghost, could we go back to your parents winning the tennis tournament? No, 
I'm sorry I ever mentioned it. Ghost. Are you interested in meeting your mother? No, I don't care to dredge up the past. It does no good. Ghost. It's interesting, though. Not to me. We are writing this book in one weekend at Jimmyville, my little compound on Maui, sitting in the Frangipan Cottage, which is next to Ginger and Bougainvillea, looking west onto the Pacific, drinking vodka gimlets in the great long lanai with the fresh hibiscus that Miyoko cuts every morning we're in residence, the doors wide open to the veranda, and me lying in my water chair, jabbering into a tape recorder, and my ghost writer sitting in a straight-back chair, twitching like a rat in a coffee can. What's the matter with you? Relax. Ghost. I am relaxed. I did not request this man. I specifically asked Viking Penguin to assign a California writer or a European, someone who could appreciate me as an individual, and I specifically said, not a Minnesotan. So what do they send? This lemon-flavored twitch from Anoka. Let me tell you, Minnesota is a cold place in more ways than one. I have always been treated more like a star in other places than in Minnesota. I went to L.A. after the election. And there were 14 TV crews following me from the airport to the NBC studios to Arnold Schwarzenegger's. 14. Minnesota? I get off a plane and everybody looks at me out of the corners of their eyes. They're afraid to show interest, to run up and say, Wow, you're great. This is fantastic. Can my girlfriend take my picture with you? People from Minnesota don't do that. It's not a show business type of place. Not much sense of fantasy very big on equality. They think nobody should ever have to fail, and nobody should ever hit it too big. Like my liberal brother-in-law. You call him an elitist, and he gets dizzy and has to go lie down. But there is a clear pecking order, and professors and doctors and lawyers and writers are at the top of it, and people like me are at the bottom. That's what grinds my butt. You're a writer. What's so hot about you? Your socks smell as bad as anyone else's ghost. I'm going to edit out the stuff about me. Like hell you are. For the record, Mr. Keeler is a tired old hack with a gecko face and thinning hair and a body like a six-foot stack of marshmallows. He is wearing a corduroy jacket and brown slacks and hush puppies. This book is his big break, and now maybe he can afford to buy a gym membership and a pair of decent shoes. <laughs>